All right, we're going to continue my teaching on uh, love. And I started talking last night about just the importance of God's love in your life. And most people don't really appreciate God's love the way that they should. And so they uh, just don't seek it and they, they think that they can live without it. I made the statement last night that as long as you can live without receiving and giving... God's kind of love in your relationships, then you will. It's not something that is natural. It has to be pursued. Colossians 3.14, I don't think I used this verse last night, but it says, put on charity or God's kind of love, which is the bond of perfectness. So that verse says that love is the bond of perfectness, or I guess you could say the perfect bond. You know, I used to lay uh, um, bricks for a living. I didn't do that too long, praise God, but I did it for a while And you had to have mortar to keep all of those bricks together. And if you were just to stack bricks without mortar, did you know it wouldn't be good at all? I guarantee you that wouldn't last very long. And there's a lot of people that have little truths from God, individual truths and different things, but they aren't all held together by this perfect bond or this perfect mortar, which is love. There's people that have these isolated truths, but love is what makes everything else in the Christian life fit together and hold together and makes a a cohesive bond out of this whole thing. So last night, basically, what I was trying to do is just stress how important it is to receive and to operate in the love of God. And so that's the point that I made last night. What I want to talk about today, and this is really so simple that this shouldn't have to be said, but I think I'd be... Uh, irresponsible if I didn't say this. And so I'm just going to mention this, and we're going to talk about this this morning, but I'm going to go on to basically the majority of this teaching is going to be about how you walk in love with other people. But I think it has to be said that you can't give away what you haven't received. If you haven't, first of all, received a supernatural revelation of God's love for yourself, you are never going to be effective in loving other people. Now, like I said, that shouldn't have to be said. That ought to be so obvious. And yet, in my dealings with people, I really believe that this is probably the number one obstacle to us not loving other people because the truth is most of us haven't understood and received the unconditional love of God for ourselves. And you wind up just basically reproducing what's ever going on in your life. This really is at the root of all of the problems. And so I'm going to spend some time this morning just talking about God's personal love for you. And I could make an entire series out of this. I just recently taught five sessions on nothing but God's love for us. And that's important, but I'm going to focus and primarily emphasize talking about how we walk in love towards others. But if you are struggling... In loving other people, I can guarantee you one of the reasons that you're struggling in loving other people is because you haven't ever really received a real revelation of God's love for you. Thank you for that thunderous silence. I know that there's some of you thinking, well, no, I I know that God loves me, but then you turn around. And you know, there are different levels of understanding this. It says over in Ephesians chapter 3, he starts praying a prayer in verse 14, and he prays there that you would, with all saints, be able to comprehend what is the height and the depth and the length and the breadth of the love of God. There is more to the love of God than just the surface knowledge. And there's a lot of people who have understood that God loves them to the point that they asked for forgiveness. I mean, they know that they deserve to go to hell And they ask for forgiveness, and so they say, oh yeah, I know that God loves me. But they really just have a very surface level. They don't have a full understanding and a full revelation. I don't think that there's any of us that have a full revelation of the love of God, myself included. I, You know, I believe it's beyond our human ability to totally comprehend this, and I'm still searching. You know, when I'm studying the Word, I've been studying the Word probably as much in the last year as I've ever studied in my life. I mean, and I am getting more out of the Word than I ever have. I'm learning brand new things. You can't ever figure out the love of God. It's infinite. It's beyond our ability. So I'm not saying that you ever get to where you've got it all figured out, but I am saying that there is more than just the surface level of understanding that God loves you. And I think that most people 
struggle in loving other people because the truth is they haven't truly received the love of God for themselves. I can tell you in my own life, I was talking to the youth back there this morning and I gave them my testimony and I won't go back and give you my whole testimony. But I got born again when I was eight years old. I knew that God loved me. And it it was the fear of God that got my attention. I was in a church service where the pastor preached a sermon on hell and he did like a tour of hell. And he went by and he says, you know, not only are the terrible people, and he talked about Adolf Hitler and people like that, but then he began to start taking some of the famous people, some of the wealthy people, some of the people that everybody respected as them being in hell too. And he was making the point that, you know, it's not just the terribly sinful people, but it all depends on your personal relationship with the Lord. Have you ever made Jesus your personal Lord? Boy, that got my attention because here I was, an eight-year-old kid. I didn't consider myself to be a terrible sinner, but I didn't, hadn't, Uh, didn't have a personal relationship. I hadn't made Jesus my Lord. So after that service, I went home and asked my dad, what is this guy saying? Would I go to hell if I died? And my dad explained to me and told me about the love of God. And it was the fear of God and punishment that got my attention and got me to asking questions. But I remember when my dad started telling me about how much God loved me, that man, that's what changed my life. And I remember kneeling down in my bedroom right beside my bed and committing my life to the Lord because I knew that God loved me, and it changed my life. And the next day in school, I was made fun of at eight years old for being a Christian. I don't know exactly what the difference was. You wouldn't think that an eight-year-old would would have that much to repent of, but anyway, my friends could tell something had happened. They said, what happened to you? And I told them I got born again. I said, Jesus is my Lord, and I lost some friends the next day because I'd gotten saved. And so it changed my life, and I believed that God loved me, but I didn't have a full understanding of it, and I fell into the trap of thinking God loved me based on my performance. And that's basically what the church was preaching, that if you want God to answer your prayers, you've got to go to church, you've got to pay your tithes, you've got to study the Word, you've got to do this, this, and this. And so I became better at it than most people. I mean, I read my Bible every single day of my life. I prayed every single day. I was doing everything they told me to do. I was witnessing. I was living holy the best I could. And if you would have asked me, do you believe that Jesus loves you? I would have said yes. But I guarantee you, I thought God's love was tied to my performance, was tied to some goodness, some worth in my life. And that's what motivated me to do all the things that I did. And on March the 23rd, 1968, when the Lord just totally transformed my life, the thing that happened was He showed me, first of all, what a hypocrite I was. And I started repenting openly in front of all the leaders of the church and everybody. We were in a prayer meeting and I just turned myself inside out and started repenting of these things, totally ruined my reputation. And... um, I, you know, some of you are going to believe I'm exaggerating, but this is honestly what was going through my 18-year-old head. I thought God was going to kill me when I found out how ungodly I was, how much of a hypocrite, a Pharisee I was. I was told that God's one that killed my dad. I was told that God's one that judged people and did things. And I honestly thought that when I saw how ungodly I was, that God was going to kill me. And right before He killed me, I was going to get everything confessed. And so I was confessing every rotten thing. I was confessing things that I didn't even know were wrong with me until just a few minutes before. I just turned myself inside out. And I was expecting God to kill me. And to my surprise, instead of Him killing me, I had an awesome awareness of His love just flood over me. There's no way I can describe it to you, but for four and a half months... I never slept over an hour at a time. I never ate a meal for four and a half months. Now, I know I slept some, and I know I ate some, because you can't live without doing that. But I mean, I just couldn't sleep. I was so excited. God loved me. I couldn't eat. I would just grab something and, and snack on things and do things like that. But for four and a half months, I was caught up in the presence of God. And it was wonderful, but... The main thing was I began to understand this love came to me when I didn't deserve it. I hadn't done anything to occasion it. It totally changed my whole theology because I had always thought that when I live holy, then God's going to love me. 
And here I was for the first time in my life realizing how unholy I was. And I had experienced a greater love of God than I'd ever experienced in my life. And it just, it was wonderful as long as those feelings persisted. For four and a half months, I was just floating on cloud nine. And the only reason I came down probably was because my mother sicked a Baptist preacher on me. And for three and a half weeks, as we toured Europe, he told me every day I was of the devil. And it finally got my eyes off of Jesus and on myself, and I lost that awareness. But after the emotion of all of that wore off, then I began to start trying to deal with this. How can a holy God love an unholy me? For the first time in my life, I'd come to realize that I didn't deserve it. And through that, I began to start understanding that God's love was unconditional. And you know what I did? I went to a deeper level of understanding God's love. And my personal testimony is that after this experience, prior to that time, I was out knocking on doors. I was leading youth visitation. I was doing all of these things. But I can tell you that in my heart, I was an introvert. I couldn't look at a person in the face and talk to them. I was doing this because I felt compelled to do it to keep the wrath of God from coming on me. And I also was thinking that if I do enough good things, maybe someday God would love me. So I was doing all of these good works, trying to please God and trying to earn something from God. But after this experience, everything flip-flopped. Prior to that time when I witnessed to people, I didn't really care about people. It was all about me. I'd get... I'd turn in a report every week how many people I led to the Lord and they'd have me stand up here behind the pulpit. And I mean as a teenager, 13, 14, 15 years old, they would pat me on the back and tell me how many people I led to the Lord each week. And that's the reason I was doing it for the attention that I was getting so that I could feel like I was pleasing God trying to earn something. Did you know after that experience, I didn't care whether anybody knew whether I was talking to somebody about the Lord. I fell in love with people for the benefit it could make to them. I was so overwhelmed with how much God loved me that I wanted the world to know how much God loved us. And I was out telling people about the Lord and wasn't even getting credit for it. Man, that was awesome. What a liberating thing that I didn't even have to get credit for. Nobody knew if I was talking to people about the Lord or not. I used to do seven or eight visits on a night and go out and knock on doors. I got to where I was talking to everything that moved. We started dividing the city up into segments, and we were knocking on a hundred doors a day, and we were leading people to the Lord and doing things. But it was all different now because instead of doing it to get God to love me, I was doing it motivated by how much God already loved me. And I wasn't trying to pay God back or earn anything. I actually loved other people. So the reason I bring all this up is to say that, see, if you would have asked me, do you believe that God uh, loves you? Do you understand the love of God? I would have said yes. But I can tell you my own personal experience is that there are deeper revelations of the love of God. And when I had that experience, instantly my love towards other people absolutely changed. And here's the point that I'm making. If you think that God loves you conditionally, And that when you're doing everything right, God is pleased with you. And when you're doing something wrong, God's displeased with you. God's not going to fellowship with you. Y'all don't look at me in that tone of voice. (laughs) There are people who preach this. Probably every one of you have lived it sometime or another. People People come up and say, well, how come I'm not filled with the joy of the Lord? Well, have you been studying the Word? Have you been praying? Have you done this and this? And we imply often that it's when you do these things that God blesses you with joy. And the reason you get healed is because you're living holy and doing all of these things. Sometimes it's not totally said that way, but that's the way that we interpret it. That's the way I was living. And because of that, if I think that God's love for me is conditional upon my performance, then guess what? I'm going, to get, I'm going to reproduce what I believe in my heart. And so here you have somebody come along. Say you're having problems in your marriage and you're trying to forgive that other person and walk in love towards them. And yet they're acting wrong. If you really believe in your heart that God only loves you when you are worth loving, He only blesses you and treats you well when you've done everything right. If you believe that, I can guarantee you, regardless of what you hear me or any other preacher say, regardless of how much you try and change your behavior and turn the other cheek, 
if you believe in your heart that you get what you deserve, you're going to wind up doing that to other people. You're going to give other people what they deserve. And that's the exact reason that many of you can't turn around and forgive your mate is because you've never truly forgiven yourself. You've never received an unconditional love. You cannot give away what you don't have. And so as we continue to talk about how to get along with people and how to walk in the love of God, I'm going to be talking about a lot of things, but man, it needs to be explained and emphasized here that you can't give away what you don't have. And if all you've received is a superficial revelation of God's love, but you don't understand the height, the depth, the length, and the breadth, if you think that it's conditional, if you think that God gets ticked off at you, you're going to get ticked off at other people. You're going to give the way that you receive. If you think that God's ready to put you on the shelf, He's so upset at you, then you're going to be quick to put other people on the shelf. You're going to, first of all, have to get a revelation of God's love for you before you can turn around and truly walk in love towards other people. And I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, this is probably the primary reason beyond anything else, beyond lack of knowledge about what we're supposed to do. Most of us have more knowledge about our responsibility to walk in love and to turn the other cheek and treat people nicer. We have a greater knowledge of what we're supposed to be doing than what we're doing. And the number one reason for that is is because we haven't received the love of God ourselves. We are at a deficit and you're trying to give away something that you don't have. And that's just simply not going to work. So let's look at some scripture over this. On this, on Titus uh, chapter 3, let me just share some things with you here. I know that by saying some of the things that I've said, some of you right now, are thinking, all right, so how do I have that experience that you had? Well, first of all, let me say, I wouldn't wish that on anybody. Some of you are thinking, what are you saying? Sounds wonderful. Did you know I've talked to a lot of people that have had some kind of a real emotional, dramatic encounter with the Lord, and 99% of the people, it'll destroy you. Because what happens is you get addicted to the emotional things And you get to where you can't live if you don't feel the love of God. And God doesn't want you to live on a feeling, emotional level. Like I said, there's a number of reasons why I lost that just feeling, this overwhelming feeling of God's presence, but I'm convinced that it would have quit anyway. God doesn't want you to live by feelings. If He just wanted you to have goosebumps all the time, you know what? He could have a bird land on your shoulder and say, God loves you call your name. He could have a dog walk up and bark to you and say, talk to you and say things. He spoke through Balaam's donkey. He could have every cloud. He could have his initials carved in it. He could do things that would give you a charge and an emotion all of the time. But that's not the nature of God. The Lord is meek and lowly in heart. It said, Jesus said that. Jesus didn't come on a 747. He didn't come in some dramatic way. Jesus could have used technology, not, not even counting the miraculous power of God, but He could have used technology to just overwhelm everybody. You know, He could have hovered over Jerusalem after He rose from the dead and had just shown Himself alive to all of these people who saw Him crucified. He didn't do any of those things because without faith it's impossible to please Him. God wants you to live by faith. And some of you are saying, so how do I get this feeling, this emotion? I'm not going to tell you. For one thing, I don't know how I got it, (laughs) man. I don't know what caused it, but you know what? I can tell you this. God doesn't want you to live on that plane. Now, feelings will come, but feelings will also go. I'm not saying that you never have positive feelings. I have good feelings, and I enjoy the joy of the Lord, but there's times that I don't feel anything, and I just keep walking and still believing that God loves me. Feelings are okay when they come. But if they're negative feelings, I reject them. If they're good feelings, I enjoy them. But I don't, I'm not dominated by feelings. And what I'm saying is most people who have a dramatic encounter and experience this overwhelming love of God, they never recover from it. They become addicted to it to where they have to have a bigger feeling, a better feeling, and eventually it ruins them. You know, the best thing that ever happened to me was right after this experience happened, I got drafted and sent to Vietnam, and all the feelings were gone. And I was in Vietnam, and I mean, I was around terrible sin and perversion, and I was being drawn constantly and 
pressure on me and out of desperation, I just stuck my nose in the Bible. And I started reading up to 10, 12 hours a day studying the Word. And you know what? When I went into Vietnam, I was a Baptist. And when I came out, I wasn't. And I didn't try and change. I just got into the Word and found out that it was no longer compatible with what the Baptists were preaching. And it changed my life. And it was one of the best things. And I switched from an emotional feeling that God loved me to the truth and the knowledge that God loved me. And that's what changed my life. So over in Titus chapter 3, the reason I wanted to point this out, Paul is giving some instructions to Titus about how to run the church. And he's telling about how the older men are supposed to act, etc. In Titus chapter uh, 3, am I in the right spot? That's not right. What am I thinking of? I'm thinking of the verse that says, the older women are supposed to teach the younger women. Chapter 2. Thank you very much. Titus chapter 2, verse 4. You're supposed to, the older women are supposed to teach the younger women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be chaste, discreet, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. Here's the reason I'm wanting to point that out is it says that you teach yourself to love. And it's the same way. Not only do you teach yourself to love other people, but you have to teach yourself the love of God. And this is what happened to me when I got into Vietnam. Out of desperation, I had to do something to keep my mind away from all of these temptations and things that were out there. I started studying the Word, and through the Word of God, God started teaching me His love for me. And you know, as great as this experience was that I told you about, where I was just caught up into the presence of God, and for four and a half months, the love of God just overwhelmed me. Did you know that the revelation that I have of God's Word now about the love of God is a million times stronger, a lot more beneficial, because for one thing, it's something I can get a handle on. Anytime I want to, I can take the Word of God and start teaching myself that God loves me and reminding myself of it. Whereas this emotion, it was just something that came upon me. It came and it went. I couldn't grab hold of it. I couldn't control it. I couldn't make it start. I couldn't make it stop. People who are looking for just some kind of an emotional level to where they just know that God loves them, you're, you're searching for something that you can't build a foundation on. You can't live by emotions. But if you can get the revelation from God's Word, you can teach yourself that God loves you. You can stand on this. And I guarantee you, there's some times that I've had some very, very, very bad things happen in my life. And through gritted teeth, not because I felt it, but through gritted teeth, I was sitting there saying, Father, you love me. Not because I felt it, but because I just knew it. And I had to encourage myself in the Lord and build myself up. And there's a lot of people that won't do that. But I'm trying to say through all of this that you have to get a revelation of God's love. God wants you to understand His love for you more than you want to get it. So it's not a matter of beseeching God. And I have to say this because every time I teach on something like this and I give my experience, there's people that just start, Oh God, please touch my life. Please pour your love out in me. God, please give me a revelation of your love for me the way that you touched Andrew. That's totally the wrong approach. Because you know what you're doing? You, in a sense, you may not say it in these words, what you're saying is, I'm powerless. I can't do anything about this. I just need you to touch me. Oh God, do something. This is what people are doing with revival. Oh God, we can't cause revival. We're getting a million people to pray and to beg and petition God. Oh God, pour out your spirit as if it's His fault. It's God's fault that America's going downhill and that we're becoming more immoral and that we aren't having a greater revival. So what we've got to do is get more people to pray and motivate God. Wrong, wrong, wrong. Without you saying it, you may not have thought through this, but what you're saying is God's actually responsible. If God wanted to, He could do something. And what you're saying is that God's love is conditional. He's ticked off at the body of Christ. We haven't done enough. We haven't done everything right. And so God is just letting us stew in our juice. We deserve what we're getting. That's what you're saying. I tell you, God wants revival more than you want revival. You don't have to plead and beg and ask God for revival. 
Somebody say, well, now, wait a minute. Over in Second uh, Chronicles 7, 14, if my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and forgive their sins and heal their land. Any of you ever heard that verse? Do you know what? That's an Old Testament scripture. There's a number of Old Testament scriptures that often get prayed when we're praying for revival, like Isaiah 64, 6. Oh, rend the heavens and come down. God, just pour out your power. The thing that's wrong with the New Testament believer praying that stuff is that God rent the heavens and came down through the Lord Jesus. He reconciled man unto God. And no longer do we have to approach God as this ticked off God who is letting us suffer because we've offended Him and we have to appease Him and pray and humble ourselves. No, the truth is God is not mad. He's wanting to pour out His Spirit. He has placed His Holy Spirit on the inside of every believer. And if you aren't revived, it's because you have shut off the switch. It's because you don't know what you have in Christ Jesus. Every one of you have the raising from the dead power. Every one of you can go out and see people raised from the dead and miracles happen and people set free. And if you would quit begging God to give you power and instead get into the Word and teach yourself that who you are and the love of God and start going out. And if you would encourage yourself and keep yourself in the love of God, you would have all the revival you could handle. You would have all of the positive emotions you could handle and it's up to you to encourage yourself. It says over in First um, Samuel chapter 30 that David, you know, his... The city was burnt by the Amalekites. His wife, his children were taken captive. All of the men that were with him, their families were taken captive. And it says they wept until they had no more power to weep. And then the people uh, spoke of stoning David to death. And it says right in the middle of that, 1 Samuel chapter 30, I believe it's verse 5 or 6, it says, but David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. He didn't say, oh, God, please touch me and help me. I'm just powerless. No, he encouraged himself. You know what he began to do? He went back, and I believe part of the process was he went back and remembered that God had chosen him over all of his brothers. His father didn't even think he was worthy enough to put his name in the hat. He left him out in the field and didn't even bring him before Samuel and make him one of the candidates because nobody would have picked this runt. He was the runt of the litter. Didn't even put his name in the hat. And yet Samuel said, I'm not going to sit down until you bring him. Nobody's going to sit down. He made everybody stand until they went and got David and brought him in. And he anointed him. He reminded himself of that. He reminded himself of the time he killed Goliath. He started encouraging himself in the Lord and remembering that God had anointed him and called him for a purpose and that purpose hadn't come to pass yet. And he just kept himself in the love of God. Over in Jude... Chapter 1, verse 20. We often quote this verse talking about speaking in tongues. It says, But you, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. And we use that to talk about how that when you're speaking in tongues, you're building up yourself on your most holy faith. And that's true and that's good. But the next verse is the point of that whole thing. It says, But you, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. The next verse says, Keep yourself in the love of God. Did you know that when you start praying in tongues, if you do it in faith, you can do it carnally. That's the reason that the Corinthians were rebuked for it. But if you pray in tongues in faith, you edify yourself. Promote spiritual growth is what the word edify means. You keep yourself in the love of God. God has already poured His love in us. It says in... uh, Romans chapter 5, about verse 5 or 6, it says, The love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit which is given unto us. God has already put His love on the inside. Galatians 5.22 says, The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, all of these things. God has deposited Himself. God is love. 1 John 4.8. It's put on the inside of us. We are full of the love of God. You don't need to pray and say, oh God, just love me. Pour your love out on me. If you're praying that way, you know what you're doing? You're starting from a position of unbelief. You're denying what the Word of God says, that the love of God has been shed abroad in your heart. You're denying that the fruit of the Spirit is love and that it's already in there. You're denying that you're a new creature and old things have passed away and all things have become new. And you're starting from a position of unbelief. 
So when I'm talking about getting this revelation of God, I believe it's important that you recognize this is not something you petition God for. God has already placed this love on the inside of you. A love that is greater than anything any of us have ever experienced. You know, the Lord showed me that that little emotional experience I had was like scratching the surface. It was nothing compared to what every one of us had. And this is the thing that changed my life. I realized that it what, when I quit feeling the love of God, God didn't quit loving me. It was just my emotions that got messed up because somebody followed me around for three weeks telling me I was of the devil and it got my attention off of God. <laughs> Amen. And it caused me to be discouraged. Thinking that you're of the devil is not encouraging. And so it got me into a funk. And then I didn't know, oh, no, it's gone. What do I do to get it back? You know what? That feeling that I had was nothing compared to what's really on the inside of me. And now the knowledge that God has given me of this has allowed me to walk with God in a way that that feeling and emotion never did. And so you can keep yourself in the love of God. Don't pray and say, oh, God, just please pour out your love into my life. Now, you can pray, Father, I want a revelation of what you've already given me. But see, that's at least starting from a position of faith. That's at least acknowledging that when he says that he has given you his love and he's commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, at least you're acknowledging that he has done it. But Father, I need a revelation of it. I don't want it to just be in here somewhere. I want the revelation. I want the benefit of it. That's okay to pray that God would help you to get revelation. But when you start off by saying, oh God, just please pour your spirit out, you're saying, I'm powerless. I can't do anything about it. That's wrong. You know what? Your revelation of God's love is completely dependent upon you. God is the same towards every person in here. God doesn't have any person in here that He loves more than another person. He loves every one of us exactly the same. And you know, I'm not, I don't, I'm not saying these things to put myself on a pedestal. I hope you understand what I'm saying. I'm just trying to illustrate and get this point across. But I can guarantee you this. I know that God loves me. I believe it. I believe God carries my picture in His wallet. I believe God's got an 8 by 10 of me on His mantle. I know that God loves me. And I can tell you it has transformed my life. And because of that, it's been 30 Eight, uh, 36, 38 years since I've been depressed. I don't get depressed. I don't get discouraged. I have depressing and discouraging things happen to me, but the love of God just overwhelms it all. The fact that God loves me just insulates me. It keeps me from being bothered the way that a lot of people are bothered. So I'm saying that by example, I know what my limited revelation of God's love has accomplished in my life And I meet people all of the time that don't have the same benefits of God's love working in their life that I have working in mine. And I don't believe that God loves me any more than anybody else. It's just the revelation of that love that has made the difference in my life. And if that's true, if God's love is the same towards every one of us in here, and if I can testify that God's love has just radically transformed me and caused my son to be raised from the dead and miracles, faith works by love, if all of these things are working in me because of a revelation of God's love for me, and if He loves you exactly the same, then you got no reason to blame God and approach God as, oh, God, touch me and do something. The fault lies that we haven't got a revelation of God's love for us, and that's up to you. If you seek, you find. If you knock, it's opened unto you. You have to pursue it. It says over in uh, Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11, we often quote that verse, It says, I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you an expected end. That's a great verse. But then it goes on to say in verse 13, and you shall seek me and you shall find me when you shall search for me with all your heart. It didn't say that you're going to find it if you just come to a conference and you devote one week and say, all right, God, I'm giving you a week and if you can give me a revelation and change my life in a week's time, great. If not... On Monday, I'm back to where I was. Or you're watching television and you're praying right before you go in. Say, God, I got 15 minutes. You got 15 minutes. If you can touch my life in the next 15 minutes before my favorite show comes on, 
I'd appreciate it. You know what? You aren't going to receive that way. It says you seek and you find when you search with all of your heart. When you get to a place that I cannot live without knowing that God loves me, then you will experience the love of God. But as long as you can live without it, you won't. As long as it's something, it'd be nice if you got it, but you got so many other things that are more important and that you're devoting your time to and you just haven't got time to really make yourself completely committed to God, you'll never get a revelation of how God loves you. You know, often when I talk about this experience, March 23rd, 1968, I don't really understand everything that went on. And so it really was the grace of God. I'm not saying that I caused it, but I did cooperate with some things. I got to seeking what God's will for my life was. I was in high school and they were telling me that, you know, you got to start making decisions about what your vocation is going to be. And so for about 18 months, nearly two years before I had this experience, I didn't know exactly how to find out what God's will for your life is. I asked the people in the Baptist church and nobody could tell me. You just do something and ask God to bless it. And I thought, boy, that's lame. There's bound to be something better than that. And so what I did, I just started studying the Word. And I mean, when I was a senior in high school, I would read the Word from about 9 or 10 o'clock every night until 2 in the morning, 1 to 2 in the morning. And I did that every single day. We had a, I had a desk on my lamp and I'd get sleepy. But this desk, uh, this lamp had these fluorescent light bulbs in it. It was a gooseneck thing that you could bend over and I'd put it over the Bible and I'd read. And when I got sleepy, I'd fall over and burn my head on that lamp and it'd jar me and wake me up. And I made myself, I read through the Bible three or four times my senior year of high school. Now I'm not saying that that made God do this, but I am saying That's how hungry I was, how much I was seeking to know what God's purpose for my life was. I thought I was just seeking to know what God's will for my life was. I didn't really know that I was seeking a revelation of the love of God. I didn't do it perfectly, but I'm saying there was a a seeking on my part that prepared my heart and made this happen. There's a reason why God touches some people and doesn't touch other people. And it's not because God is like that. It's because God looks at our heart and God can tell when you're seeking with all of your heart. God can tell when you are to a place that, man, God, I just can't live without a greater revelation of you. I want to know you. And I'm saying if you would get that attitude, it's just like a lightning rod. It'll draw the power to you. It'll draw manifestation. And so... You need a revelation of God's love for you and it's not right to petition God as if it's His fault. You ought to start by saying, Father, Your Word says that You already love the whole world. I I understand it. I just haven't got a full revelation of it. And so you start praying, Oh God, help me to understand the love that You already have for me. And you get into the Word and you start seeking Him. And when you get a right heart in this matter, God will reveal His love to you. And then... Once you experience this supernatural love of God and it goes beyond just an emotion, it becomes something that you understand and you have an understanding of it from the Word, then you can start loving other people. And if I had time, again, I could spend a whole series, I could spend a week teaching on this one point that I'm making today. But if I had time, I could show you so many things. He was talking one time about forgiveness and he gave as a parable a man who had been forgiven 10,000 talents which a talent was 75 pounds worth of either gold or silver. Imagine how much 10,000 talents of anything is worth. And this man was going to be hauled off to prison, but because he didn't have anything to pay, he fell down on his knees and begged the master and says, Please, please forgive me. Give me time. I'll pay you all. And because he asked, his master forgave the entire debt, just said it's paid for But the man immediately left there and went out and found somebody who owed him just a few pence. It was less than one ten thousandth of the amount that he had been forgiven. And he he grabbed this guy by the throat and said, pay me this five dollars or whatever it amounted to. And he said, no, I'm not going to forgive you. And the guy said, I can't. Give me time. And he says, no, I won't forgive you. And he threw him into prison until he paid all. And when his master heard about it, He came back and he said, you wicked servant, I forgave you this huge debt and you wouldn't even forgive a person 
this little amount. And he says, now I'm going to cast you into prison until you pay it all. And then he went on and the whole point of the parable was, he says, those who have been forgiven little, for, uh, you know, love little, and those who have been forgiven much, love much. This guy didn't fully understand what had happened to him. If he would, This is the key to learning to love others. If you could understand the great price that you've been forgiven. If you could understand. See, we do a comparative thing. And we think, well, I'm a pretty good person. I don't dip or cuss or chew or go with those that do. And so I'm okay. But you know what? Compared to God. Compared to what God made Adam and Eve to be. Compared to what God created us to be. Every one of us in here has just totally, totally, totally destroyed the great creation that God originally created us to be. Man, we've, we've done things that are terrible. And it took the blood of Jesus. Jesus had to die for your sin. Most of us just don't have a clue. You know, I, because I haven't done a lot of the sins that most people have done, there's people that come to me sometimes and think, well, you just don't know what it's like. You've never murdered anybody. You've never raped. You've never plundered. You've never done all of these things. You just don't know. It's really proportional to your revelation. I may not have done some of the things that some of you have done, but I've had a revelation from God of my sinfulness, that experience I was telling about March the 23rd, 1968. And I've seen my relative unworthiness more than most of you have ever seen it. And some of you may not understand that because, again, we just think in human terms and we compare ourselves among ourselves, but the Bible says that isn't wise. I mean, God put His holy light on me. And even though I haven't done some of the things that you consider wrong, I guarantee you God showed me that there wasn't a hell deep enough or an eternity long enough to punish me. I deserve to go to hell. Every last one of us deserves to go to hell. If you could get a full revelation of that and understand the depths to which you've been forgiven, you wouldn't have a problem at all forgiving somebody else who's gone out and committed adultery on you or stolen from you. Those things are so minor in comparison to the things that we've done to God. A person that's having trouble forgiving somebody else is because you don't fully understand how much you've been forgiven. You don't have a complete revelation of God's love for you or you would, in comparison, nobody, I don't care what they've done to you, nobody has done to you what you've done to God. Nobody has ever taken a life and destroyed it the way that you destroyed your life prior to receiving salvation. And if you could ever get a revelation of that, once you understand the love of God, it just makes it super easy to forgive other people. Because look how much you've been forgiven. How could, it's as inconsistent as this guy that was forgiven 10,000 talents and yet he went down and wouldn't forgive somebody a minor debt. How terrible that is. That's exactly the way you are if you have any unforgiveness in your heart towards somebody else. And you're saying, but you don't realize what they did to me. I'm saying you don't realize what you did to God. You don't have a full revelation of God's love for you. Once you understand God's love for you, I tell you what, it just, it changes everything. But you can't give away what you don't have. If you haven't understood God's love for you, it is impossible for you to turn around and walk in God's kind of love towards other people if you aren't, first of all, applying it towards yourself. I'm telling you that this is at the root of everything. Man, i got so many other scriptures I was planning on using. Let's just turn over 1 Corinthians chapter 13 real quickly and let me go through a few things because some of you think, well, man, I'm walking in love towards others. Let me just give you a little uh, definition, scriptural definition of how God's kind of love is. And this verse is really talking about God's love uh, towards other people. But you can say the same thing. If this is the way that God wants us to love other people, this is also how God loves us. And so you can take every truth that we're going to read about right here and also apply it not only in how you should treat other people, but how God is treating you. And so 1 Corinthians chapter 13, it's often called the love chapter. In verse 1 it talks about, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, God's kind of love, it profits me nothing. Even if you can operate in the gifts of the Holy Spirit, but if you aren't motivated by love, you're just sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal is what it goes on to say. 
Verse 2, it says, Though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity or God's kind of love, I am nothing. Boy, there's some of you in here that have had faith and you've seen God perform miracles and yet there still isn't joy and satisfaction and contentment in your life because you haven't got the revelation of God's love. I tell you, that love, as it goes on to say in the last of this chapter, is the greatest of all of these, faith, hope, and love. In verse 3 it says, And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, God's kind of love, it profits me nothing. Your giving might help me if you give to me, but it's not going to help you if you don't do it with the right motivation. There's more to giving and receiving than just putting money in the bucket and automatically you get a harvest off of it. If that's all it was, every one of us in here is given enough money that you ought to be a millionaire. You ought to have a bunch of money. But you know what? Your attitude, motive behind your gift can totally cancel out all benefit of that gift to you. If you don't give motivated by love, it profits you nothing. And if you have given because it's a debt, it's a necessity, you're cursed with the curse if you don't give, you have just voided all of the return on that giving. Your motive behind your giving is more important than your giving. In verse 4, it begins to give characteristics of God's kind of love. It says, charity, God's kind of love suffers long and is kind. Now, like I said, you've got to apply this in two ways. If you're talking about your relationship to other people, and you say, well, I, I'm walking in love. Well, let me just ask you, do you suffer long? Are you kind? Or do you have a short fuse? Are you like Grady was talking about this morning, you know, that somebody gives you a ticket because you parked illegally or something, and you get upset and mad at them, and you're the one who broke the law. You know what? If you don't suffer long in a kind, if you get, if you get ticked off easily, if a person breaking in line in front of you is going to cause you problems, and all of these little things, did you know what? You can sit here and say, oh, yeah, I walk in the love of God. But that's not the love of God. God's kind of love suffers long, and it's kind. Did you know kindness is something that's nearly nearly gone in our society? And that's the reason that when Grady and Yvonne were nice because they missed their flight and they were kind when other people were yelling and screaming. And uh, he said something about Andrew Wama. He said, oh, is that the reason that you've been kind? Are you a Christian? I guarantee you that's what makes the difference. Well, we've been in some situations where they've just, you know, they've canceled a flight. And you're left to sleep in an airport all night long. And everybody's screaming and yelling. Upset. And we've, we've been right there. And, you know, we stood in line for an hour and a half or two hours. When I finally got up there, the first thing I did was tell this woman, I said, you know, thank you for your patience. I said, all these people are mad at you. And I said, you aren't the one that caused this. And I said, I'm not pleased about what happened, but I said, it's not your fault. I just want to say thanks. You know, that woman looked at me and she'd have hugged me if she could have gotten across that counter. She was so thankful and she says, boy, it's so true. She says, I'm so mad at the people in the office. If, if they made them come down here and deal with these customers, they wouldn't make these decisions. And, you know, she blessed Jamie and me, gave us a suite at a hotel, gave us all these vouchers to eat and upgraded us to first class the next day on our trip to England. Amen. <laughs> Now, I didn't do it for that reason, but you know what? It stands out like a heel thumb nowadays when somebody's kind. I was on a flight from uh, Atlanta, and I forget the details. I remember that they had snow and ice, and they had to de-ice planes, and Atlanta isn't set up to de-ice planes. And because of it, we sat on the runway for three hours waiting to be, uh, you know, de-iced before we could take off. And I don't even remember what happened. But they sent me a voucher and they said that the steward has talked about your attitude and how nice you were and says because of the way that you treated this stewardess, they gave me a free trip someplace. I don't even remember what I did. But you know what? It's just unusual today that somebody's kind. And I read in Reader's Digest about this guy who got his flight canceled and he was at this service desk, you know, trying to get his flights rebooked and everybody was standing in line. There was this huge line, and he just walked right around, went up to the front, and he said, I want to be rebooked here. And this lady says, you have to get to the back of the line. And this guy says, do you know who I am? 
do you know who I am? And this woman got her microphone out and she says, does anybody know who this man is? Apparently he's forgotten. (laughs) And he just slunk off in humility and stuff like that. But you know what? We're all laughing, but I bet some of you are the ones that get irate, and yet you're sitting here saying, oh, I understand and I know the love of God. You know what? God's not like that. Now, I'm not saying that there isn't a time to ever take something back and say, here's what your guarantee says, and here's what your product performed, and you know what? I need compensation. I'm not saying that you don't ever do something, but I'm saying there's a right and a wrong way to do it. God's kind of love suffers long and is kind. If you aren't long-suffering and kind, you can say what you want to, but what your words speak so loud, nobody I mean, your actions speak so loud, nobody can hear what you're saying. Amen or oh me. And remember that God is this way. God's kind of... He's long-suffering and He's kind. And yet there are some of you that just... You're absolutely convinced that if you don't do everything right, if you mess up, that God's upset with you, that God's not going to bless you, God's not going to move in your life. You know what you need to do? You need to take these characteristics of God's kind of love and apply it to yourself. And say, Father, you know, I feel like you're sick and tired of me. I'm sick and tired of me. But you aren't that way. You are long-suffering and you're kind. You aren't going to... God doesn't treat you the way you think He does. You need to take these verses and encourage yourself in the Lord and keep yourself in the love of God goes on to say that charity envieth not. You know, I'm out of time. i got to quit. But you ought to study these. Does not behave itself unseemly. That means it always does what's proper regardless of how you feel. There's some people that say, Oh, I'm just so in love. I can't keep my hands off of this person. We just love each other so much. Lust. If it's God's kind of love, it will behave itself. It will behave properly. If you can't control yourself, it's not God. Man, these are powerful. I wish I had time to go through every one of these. Look in verse 7. It says, He bears all things. Some people say, I just can't bear anymore. How much can you be expected to take? I mean, I've only got, I'm only human. You know what you're saying? You haven't operated in God's love yet. Because if you've reached the end of your rope, that means you're doing it out of your own strength and own power. When you're operating in God's kind of love, it will bear all things. It will believe all things. How many times have people told me, I just can't believe that anything's going to come out of this marriage. I just lost faith for it. Well, you aren't operating in God's kind of love. God's kind of love can believe all things, hope all things, endure all things. How many times have I heard people say, I just can't stand it anymore. All you've done is just say, you aren't in God's love yet. You're still operating out of a carnal, physical, fleshly love. God's kind of love can bear all things. God's kind of love never fails. Man, I wish I had time to go through every one of these. But let me just say that, you know what? Most of us are deficient in loving other people because we don't know how much God loves us. Let me end with this. I've got to say this one thing. This Steve Martin that I pointed out earlier... It was up here. He paid me probably the best compliment to this school that I've ever heard last week. We were out playing golf, and I was talking to him, and Steve and Kenzie came to school here, and they had a lot of problems. Uh, There was marriage problems. Jamie and I talked to them. And, I mean, they were serious marriage problems. And when we were playing golf, they've now been in... uh, Kenzie graduated a year ago. Steve just graduated. Steve... Or, no, I guess he did an uh, apprenticeship. And so anyway, they've been here for three or four years. And um, I was just asking them, I said, so how was school? How did it go? And he was telling me how good it was. And I said, and so how, how did the marriage go? And he says, you know what? We have probably the best marriage of anybody I know of. And he just said, it's wonderful. We love each other. And I said, so what, what happened? What did you guys do? And he says, really, we haven't done anything as far as counseling with somebody else are forgiving each other. He says, we didn't do anything with each other. We just both got our own lives touched. And as we understood the love of God, he says, now we love each other. And all of that other stuff is taken care of. He says, we didn't do anything or very little between them. He says, we just both fell in love with God and understood how much God loves us. And as a result, our marriage is totally transformed. 
And you know, this is the approach that I believe is missing in the church today. Most marriage seminars you go to, it's all about writing letters and communicating and all of this kind of stuff. And I don't want to get off on that. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with communicating. But you know, before you got married, you communicated just fine. You'd stay on out phone hours. You just couldn't stand being apart from each other. Communication isn't the problem. It's just the stuff that you're communicating that's the problem. And if all they do is teach you how to communicate, then that's just going to enable you to put them down better and to communicate more viciousness and strife. What you need is to get your heart changed, get a revelation of the love of God, and you get full of the love of God, and I guarantee you that will change your marriage. Fifty, a hundred years ago, nobody ever heard of communication in marriage. They didn't have marriage seminars on that. And marriages were holding together better then than they are now with all of the modern techniques. Because all of the modern techniques are dealing with the external problems and they aren't going to the root of it. The root of it is you can't give away what you don't have. And we are so selfish and so self-centered that you know what? We are reproducing this. And that's the reason when you divorce this person and you go get married again, surprise, surprise, you have the same problems. And you can't figure out, why did I, I thought I got a different person this time. You did, but you brought the same person into the marriage. You brought you and all of your baggage and stuff into the marriage. It's not that person that's your problem. It's you that's the problem. And if you would fall in love with God and let the love of God work in you, the love of God would transform your marriage. Amen. 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 Praise God. i got to let you go. Father, we just love you and we thank you for the truth. Thank you for the Word of God. And Father, we believe that you already love us. You proved it through Jesus. Father, Jesus bore all of our sins and suffered and came to this earth and limited himself to being a human being for 33 years. Father, what love. We believe that you love us. And Father, we just pray for a greater revelation of it. We pray that as we get into the Word of God and as we seek with all of our heart, we believe that we find the height, the depth, the length, and the breadth of the love of God. That Father, we would come to understand your great love for us in such a way that it transforms us and then we will turn around and share that love with other people. Father, we thank you for that. We agree and we receive it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Praise God.